How's it going, fellas? Welcome to Halo Wars 2. This is a professional guide to the Halo Wars 2 multiplayer, done by one of the best players, if not the best player, in Halo Wars 2, otherwise known as Rock Generation. Now, he was kind enough to let me post this video to the channel, and if you want to see some more content from him, I've linked his YouTube in the description, as well as his Twitch. Um, this is going to be a 10-part guide, which basically breaks down 10 things that Rock Gen thinks you should know before you play Halo Wars 2, or 10 things that he wishes he would have known. So this is an advanced guide and should hopefully help you out in the multiplayer games that you're going to be embarking on. And even if you've already played Halo Wars 2 a lot, there's almost certainly something in here which will help you too, because there's things I didn't know, and look how many videos I've posted. So enjoy, thanks to Rock Gen, check him out in the description, and hopefully you'll learn something. I know you will. Hello and welcome back to my channel. I'm Rock Generation, and you have probably seen me in YouTube videos, Twitch live streams, or in tournaments. I have been playing for about six years and I play competitively, and I have been champ on the ladder a lot of the time. There are many things I wish I had known sooner during my development in Halo Wars 2, so I thought I would create a video for you guys so you don't have to learn the hard way like I did. So without further ado, here are 10 things I wish I knew when I started. Okay, starting off, head over to Option Extras, go to the Game tab, make sure you have the default zoom set to zero. This will make sure that when you spawn in, you're zoomed out as much as possible and you don't have to do this manually every game so you can see as many units as possible. Next, go over to this controller tab here and we're going to go to scroll speed and you want to make sure you crank this up to a sufficient number. Higher is generally better, but you want to make sure you do this in increments. Don't push yourself too quickly, get used to it slowly. I personally play on 88, other top players often play on 100. I think it's too fast. I think you lose fine motor movements and it can become difficult to micro the small units. So be careful with this. The goal is to just be as fast as possible. You want to make sure you maintain some amount of accuracy as well. And these next two settings I think are often overlooked by Halo Wars 2 players in the community. It's something I wish I had paid attention to sooner in my Halo Wars 2 career. So camera follow works a lot like aim assist in a first person shooter. It allows you to lock onto a unit and keep your cursor on it. This helps you throw grenades more accurately, lets you track it. This is really helpful for your own controller and some of these fast engagements with scouts. Uh, if you're using grunt mine, you can miss the grunt nine throw and throw it on the ground instead of on the unit. So I personally put camera follow on. Sometimes it can mess up your micro. Sometimes it moves your cursor when you don't want to. Uh, but generally in nine out of 10 situations, I find it's usually pretty beneficial and positive. Uh, I really have much trouble with this with this setting on and uh, next up is sticky selection and this one is a little complicated it's hard to describe I think but um, essentially this helps you use the advanced commands in Halo Wars 2 so one of those it, for example is the hold ground command so oftentimes you select a unit you go somewhere across the map you do the double tap LB and you lock your unit on the ground if you don't have sticky selection on and you click too close to the mini base or you mess up your button slightly, you can accidentally cancel the hold ground and it'll fail and it won't actually put the unit on the hold ground. And so oftentimes you'll have to go all the way back to the unit that you were wanting, go back to the place you wanted to put them and do the whole process again. And this can cost you lots of time and it can be tedious. Um, so with sticky selection on, it makes it so that you can't deselect a unit unless you click B. So just clicking on the ground won't accidentally deselect a unit. I find this very helpful. I was missing hold grounds all the time and I couldn't figure out why. And then I was told about this setting and it helped me immensely. I wasn't failing any of my advanced commands nearly as much anymore. So I highly advise you put on this setting. It was very beneficial for me. And the third category here, we're going to go to video, and you're actually going to want to go to this always shows hit point bars setting, and you want to make sure this is on. This allows you to see all the health bars of your opponent and your unit, so they don't have to be taking damage to know what the health is. It's really important in Halo Wars 2. And just like other competitive games that you play, it's really important that you make sure your FPS and your game is running optimally. So I personally play with my settings a lot lower to maximize FPS. I love having high performance. I really want to make sure when I move around, I don't get lag. So tinker with these a bit, go through them, make sure you're matching your monitor's FPS. I personally play at 144. I try to make sure my FPS is idling around 200 to 300 at the start of the game. So as the game progresses and gets more demanding in the later stages of the game, I still make sure I'm above that 144 threshold and maintaining my monitor's output rate. 
Uh, also, if you are a NVIDIA GPU user, make sure you go down to the foliage settings and make sure you turn this off. There's a bug right now with the newest graphics drivers. Uh, just make sure this is off. So you'll have plants spawning all of your map. It's ridiculous. So save yourself now and turn this setting off. And now finally, go ahead and go over to the audio tab. Personally, I had the music volume turned all the way down. This music on the main thing gets so annoying. So uh, Next, for the voice and SFX volumes, uh, you can tinker with, with these a bit, but make sure you don't put them to zero. They contain important alerts that let you know of your surroundings and your map awareness. So mini bases getting hit, nodes being captured, your man getting hit, etc. It's really important to make sure you have that awareness. Audio cues can be vitally important in this game. Okay, so I have the minimap pulled up on screen, and at the top of the minimap you can see a bar with a blue sliver in it. This bar represents your leader power progression, and when it reaches the end, you will unlock another leader point. Each additional point requires more XP to unlock. Here is a chart of the XP values in the game. On the left side of the chart is the order of the leader power points. You start the game with one point and count upward. The figures on the right side of the table represent the amount of XP required to unlock that point. So for example, to unlock your third leader power in the game, you will need around 1,300 XP to unlock it. So at this point, you're probably wondering, how do I get XP? How much do you get for doing the different things in game? Well, essentially, doing most actions in the game will give you leader point XP. Anything from killing enemy units, to destroying enemy structures, to capturing nodes will award you leader point XP. Let's get more specific here. I have all the figures here for all the most redundant and important actions you will do in game. The goal of showing you these figures is not to have you memorize all the exact values for things you can do in the game, but it's to give you a general outline and idea in your head that while you're playing, you know what actions are more rewarding, which ones are less, so you can get faster leader powers in game. All right, so to start off, you actually generate about 1.4 XP a second in game all the time, no matter what you're doing. This is the constant background rate. This works out to be about 84 XP a minute. And this list will be in order of least to greatest, so the smallest amount of XP actions to the greatest amount of XP per action. All right, so right off the bat, you get three XP for every time one of your own units dies. This is regardless of how big a health the unit is, every single unit is worth three XP when it dies. And you get five XP for an enemy unit being killed. So you're rewarded more for killing enemy units than you are losing units, but you do get some amount of XP for losing your own troops. Next up, we have 12 XP. This is for self-destruction. So if you have a mini base, a pad, whatever it is, if you self-destruct it, you get 12 XP for that action. All right, so now we're on 40 XP, and every time you buy a building or you buy a turret, you get 40 XP when you do this. But there's a really important detail about this fact. This only works for the first five of every building and turret structure. So your first five turrets, you'll get XP, but after that, you won't get any more XP for any more turrets you buy. The same goes for supply pads, generators, barracks, armories, every unique building type. You only can buy five of them, and then you stop getting XP. So essentially, you're capped at 200 XP per building type in the game. Next, you get 40 XP for upgrades, and this is building upgrades, turret upgrades, unit upgrades, anything you spend yellow on, that's an upgrade. So if I just spend yellow on a unit, if the unit costs yellow itself, that doesn't give you XP, but if it's anything to upgrade, so if I upgrade a pad, if I upgrade a generator, if I upgrade an infantry unit, any type of upgrade that requires yellow, you will receive 40 XP for this. And there is no cap on this. There is no five building cap. You can do this as many times as you want in the game. So spending yellow will always yield that XP for you. And up next, we have 40 XP per node capture. This does not work for decapture. And what a decapture is, is when you take an enemy node and you turn it to neutral. This does not count as a capture and you won't receive XP for this. You will only get the 40 XP if you fully turn it to your color and make the node yours. Next up, you get 50 XP for destroying an enemy structure. It doesn't matter if it's a supply pad, a generator, or a turret, a mini base, an entire base, you get 50 XP for destroying that structure. And we have now reached the highest yielding XP actions in the entire game. So you will get 60 experience points every time you build a mini base. And this does not have the five capture rule. So you can buy as many mini bases as you want all game, and you'll get 60 experience points every time you do so. And also, it's the same for bases. So every time you buy a new base, you get 60 XP. Okay, so that was a lot of information thrown at you. That was a lot of numbers to remember. Let's revisit that and let's recap what we just learned. So essentially, mini bases are the best bang for your buck. 
They yield the highest XP at 60 XP per mini base, and mini bases only cost around 200 supplies in the game, sometimes 300 supplies for the double mini bases. And there's no limit on this, so this is one of the best things you can do in the game to speed up your leader point progression. The second best thing you can do is play offense. Offense is highly incentivized and rewarded in this game. Every time you destroy an enemy structure, you get 50 XP. This is the second highest yield in the entire game you can get. After that, it's just about playing normal, staying proactive and doing things in the game. The more you do, the more XP you will be rewarded. So buy buildings, upgrade them, kill enemy structures, take notes. These are all great ways to earn XP in the game and to speed up your leader power progression. Alright, so this next category is probably one of the more high level skills in the game. It really helped elevate my openers to the next level. Using the Q commands are essential to optimizing early game builds. It allows you as the player to focus on early game harassment, mini base buys, and your build because it frees up more of your attention by automating some of the early game resource pickup processes. So to use the Q commands, it's essentially the same thing as just using normal commands. Instead of pressing X, you hold the right trigger and you press the X at the same time. That's it, it's that simple. The most beneficial use of this command is the early game pickup of resources. To use this on resources, you will need to hold RT and press X on each and every resource bundle you want your unit to collect. This can feel pretty tedious at first, and it takes a while to get used to, but if you can master this early game trick, it will really improve your gameplay. Particularly on controller, it can be difficult to accurately click on each bundle in the pile and properly execute the queue. But stick with it, I promise you it gets easier the more you practice it. It's just really difficult at first to get used to. So I really wish I understood how veterancy worked years ago when I was learning Halo Wars 2. Getting vet on a unit is one of the most powerful damage and armor buffs you can get in the entire game. Here is the chart with all the values here below. Uh, this is not universal. There are a few leaders that actually have different values, but they're pretty close and it's not worth listing all of the exceptions here. So in general, you can be pretty sure that most units and leaders you're using have these values here. Now, I'm not sure if the game was purposefully designed this way, but you cannot get any veteran CXP while moving a unit. So if you're chasing an army and you're killing units, you are getting rewarded absolutely no XP for doing so and you will not get any closer to veterancy. The only way to get XP for a kill is to stand still and get the kill while not moving. This is extremely frustrating because moving around in this game is extremely important and standing still is just not really an option most of the time. As you can see here in this clip, I have my chosen chasing down 10 grunts and because I'm moving I'm getting rewarded 0 XP for all of these kills so even after 10 kills I do not have a veterancy 1 of my chosen and 10 grunts is more than enough XP to get vet 1 of my leader. And in the second clip, you can see I'm standing still and I get veterancy 1 after only getting a few kills. So you have to stand still to get the XP in this game. It's really frustrating, but while you're playing, just try to find moments that you can stand still and really take advantage of this XP. So there is absolutely no way I can comprehensively cover a topic as big as micro without leaving out a lot of stuff, but I've broken it down to a handful of concepts and tricks that I really wish I had known from day one when I started playing Halo Wars 2. This is much more higher level micro that you will see from other top players in show matches on streams. But if you can get proficient at these few moves, it should elevate your play a lot too. Alright, and to start this off we have wiggling. This is how it's commonly referred to, but you can call it whatever you want. But essentially this is moving unit back and forth or kind of in a circular motion really rapidly to avoid damage. So oftentimes in a one-on-one -on -one sniper fight, one sniper will wiggle back and forth and you can actually dodge and avoid shots and win the sniper fight that way. This works with a lot of units. Not all units is this very effective with, but the units that have fast mobility this is super effective with. One common unit you will see do this is in show matches is the Reaver, so a few Reavers can oftentimes take down entire masses of Banshees because they can wiggle, go in circles, and they can avoid 90-99% of the damage. It is super effective when done well. 
as you can see in this clip here down below when I was standing still I got smoked really quickly but when all I did was apply a little bit of wiggling a little bit of motion spun in circles went left and right I would turn a situation where my reaver couldn't even kill one banshee into a situation where I killed the entire army of banshees so it makes a huge difference if you can utilize this trick so this next trick is pretty helpful for hero units, but it is useful for a lot of other units such as hunters on the ground. So essentially when a warthog or a chopper or a ghost comes in and rams your unit, your unit will take a 5 second stun around and he'll be out of commission and not be able to fire and if there's multiple warthogs ramming you, this can really add up and put your hero out of commission and really lower your output of damage. One way you can actually avoid this is if you select your hero unit and you spam X, uh, you can actually avoid the stun and, and keep moving and, and keep your hero in the fight. It's not 100%, sometimes you eat the stun, but you can avoid this about 95% of the time and it's super helpful. As you can see here in this clip, I got ran about 9 or 10 times here and I avoided every single stun my hero kept moving. And So if you need to get your hero out of a fight, this is a good trick to use. So this next trick mainly applies to Spartan hero units. I'm a Unicy player, I wish I had known this a lot sooner when I was learning Halo Wars 2. But essentially, you can click Y on enemy vehicle units and chase the army and get a super clean stun. And you don't have to necessarily have to hijack that unit. So this is really helpful in Tech 1, where you want to keep your Spartan in the fight. You don't necessarily want to hijack a small rabbit or a chopper and have your Spartan out of the fight for a while. So this can be really good to get a nice big stun, jump across the map, and you can actually cancel the hijack and still get the full stun effect. So all you have to do is mid-air in the jump, sometime between after you clicked Y and before it meets the target, you just have to click X somewhere on the ground. I usually spam it just to be safe but once you've done that he will no longer do the hijack and he'll still do the stun but that's it he'll walk away fine and you won't have to hijack that useless vehicle throw in a bunch of mine combos with this and you can have a super deadly wombo combo So I guarantee you didn't know that this game actually has a north. If you look at the compass here on the minimap, there's a little arrow somewhere on it, and that is actually north. And what you probably didn't know is a lot of leader powers in this game don't drop in the center of the radius. So when you use things like Jerome's Salvo Drop or Forge's Scatter Bomb, the leader power will actually drop to the northeast of the circle, and <laughs> the southwest of the circle will remain very much untouched. In some of my games online and in tournaments, this has actually made a tremendous difference on how much damage my leader power does to the opponent. So on screen here, I am using Jerome's Salvo Drop, and you can see this absolutely atrocious northeast that occurred here. Almost the entirety of the damage went to the northeast of the center of the reticle, so anything in that bottom left quadrant would not have been touched. And you can see in comparison here, I have to drop the circle all the way to the bottom left of the army just to get the salvo to hit correctly. Um, so this is something you need to pay attention to in your games if you're using leaders like Jerome or Forge. And this can be difficult to master because north on each map is different. Um, and you're going to spawn on different sides of the different maps. So there's a lot of things. You just have to kind of check and be mindful of it as you spawn in each game. I still have trouble keeping track of this sometimes myself. Fog of War, looking into the abyss and trying to figure out what your enemy is up to. You'd be surprised actually if you look into the Fog of War and you pay attention, you can actually gather much more information than it seems. For example, did you know that you can click on your enemy's base and see what tech level they are? This is super important to determining when your opponent hits tech 2 and when they hit tech 3. Alongside this, you can usually figure out if your opponent has an expo as well. Just by hovering over in the fog, you can hear the noises of your opponent's base. This has caused a lot of problems in the past in Halo Wars 2 in live streams and show matches. The opponent will often think the enemy is stream sniping because they just seem to know too much about when their expos are coming up. But if you listen here, you can pay attention. You can actually hear buildings being destroyed and buildings being built. And if you have a really good ear, you can actually pick out which building is being built because they all have slightly different animations and noises when being constructed. And furthermore here, if you actually pay attention to the fog, you can sometimes hear troop units.
there is some kind of range cap on this. You can't just hear units all over in the fog, but it does extend outside of your normal vision. So somewhere in that buffer zone, you can actually hear troops moving around, and this can be super helpful to hearing an attack coming five or 10 seconds early. So one of the most important resources for you to manage at the upper level is the energy. And a lot of people just refer to energy as yellow. It's a lot simpler to remember. And there are two ways to increase your power production. Either you buy more generators or you take more nodes. And generators get quite expensive quite quickly. They start at 200 and increase by 300 supplies every time you buy one. So buy your third generator, it's already costing 800 supplies. So it is essential to understand how much your generator gives you power, how much your nodes return to you, so that you can plan your tech 2 and tech 3 timings while also making sure you get your upgrades in a reasonable manner. Alright, so to start off, when you buy a generator for that time it's not upgraded, it actually generates 3 power a second. And when you upgrade the generator and it transforms into the advanced generator, it produces 6 energy a second. This works out to about 360 power a minute for the advanced generator and 180 power a minute for the unupgraded generator. So I think when I first learned how much the nodes returned in power, I was a little bit disappointed because I'm the kind of player who really likes offense. I like when the game rewards me for taking actions around the map. And unfortunately, nodes only give you 1.5 energy a second. So it essentially takes four nodes to make as much power as one upgraded generator. I think the real power in this metric is not how much energy it gives you, but how much energy it also denies your opponent. So while it only gains you 1.5 energy per second, if you take a node from your opponent, you're taking away 1.5 energy per second as well. So the net difference between the two players will be 3 energy a second. Engineers are super broken in this game. That is all. No, but seriously, if you are not incorporating engineers into your play, you are missing out big time. Their Y abilities have a 40% armor reduction and their heal rate is absolutely bonkers. I really wish I had been aware of this from day one because this absolutely makes Banish so much stronger when you take advantage of it. As you can see here in this clip, this one engineer is out healing this entire army. It's really quite ludicrous, so make sure you incorporate them into your Banish army cops. All right, we are down to our final topic here today, and we have Fire Ray. And now I think a lot of you probably actually do know about this in the game, but there's a lot of misinformation that surrounds this topic, so I'm going to teach you the proper way to do it and why it's important. So you simply select your rabbit here, you click X on the enemy structure or the enemy unit, and then you click X on the ground just once. Not twice, not three times, just once. Then you go back and you click X on the structure again, back on the ground once, and you repeat this process over and over. And by doing this, you're restarting the animation and you're making your unit fire quicker than it would otherwise. The goal of this strategy is not to do it as fast as possible, although generally quicker is better. But there is some cap and you don't want to just do it as quick as possible or you'll actually make it go slower. So you want to get into some kind of rhythm here where you're matching the rate that the rabbit can actually shoot at. Perfecting this process can almost double your DPS, so really practice this. It's a high level thing you'll see in a lot of tournaments and streams. Uh, every top player uses this method. Rabbits are kind of the rat of the scout world on Tech 1. They, they're often running and they're weaker, so this is a good way to have them contend with the higher level scouts. So take advantage of this, get better at it, and it will elevate your gameplay a lot. One common mistake I even see other top players do a lot is they just spam X as fast as they can and they just shake their screen around. This is not the correct way to do it. You want to methodically click once on the structure and once on the ground and you want to repeat this process and do it quicker and quicker until you become proficient at it. There are a few units who can actually take advantage of this but most notably you'll see the jackrabbit do it a lot. 
And with that, guys, that concludes my 10 things I wish I knew when I started Halo Wars 2. I hope you learned something today. If you enjoy this long-form content, please let me know on what you'd like to see next. I'd love to help you guys out. If you have any questions at the end of this video, which I'm sure you will have because I am not the greatest at explaining things, please feel free to reach out and DM and message me. I will be happy to elaborate on anything I've mentioned in this video. My target audience for this video was not anyone who is completely new. It's assuming you have IQ above room temperature and you've been playing for a little bit and you know a few features of the game already, but I didn't want to just target the upper champ players again. I wanted to get those people in the middle who are growing and trying to learn and just don't know a lot of these details because quite honestly, if you Google and you look around on YouTube, there is just absolutely no videos with any of the amount of information that I just put in this video. No one knows anything about veterancy and no one knows anything about leader point XP. There's just so much that's not out there and you have to know the right people to get the information from. So I hope this helped you guys. Thank you so much for watching. Watching. And as always, I'm Rock Generation, and I'll see you next time.